And good afternoon. It is 2 p.m. Saturday, June the 8th, uh, 2 p.m. Central Time in St. Louis, and you're listening to Altitude Adjustment. I'm Leon Davis, and I want to thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to apologize to Restream.io. Last week, I uh, thought uh, mentioned that I was having some difficulty and that I was not going to use Restream.io, but I found out the difficulty is uh, Restream.io allows you the opportunity to stream to multiple platforms at the same time, and they have a um, monitoring window. And in the monitoring window, um, it kept showing disconnection. Um, and I thought the streams were actually disconnecting and that it was being broken up. And that's not the case. It actually continued uh, streaming to the, the sites and the stream was fine. And so uh, it did its job as far as the streaming goes. It's just the uh, monitoring window that was the problem. So um, I'm back again uh, streaming to Facebook and also to um, YouTube and uh, my Periscope account. Um, I have met some interesting people in my lifetime, and uh, one of the people that I, I haven't really had an opportunity to talk to, but their story I thought was very interesting, and I, I wanted to present that to you, and that's coming up in just a moment. Welcome to Altitude, Altitude. 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 Adjustment. All righty, and thank you again. Um, so so uh, I... I also work with a friend of mine on his podcast um, where he deals with music. And one of the people that I had an opportunity to be introduced to was the young lady that I have on uh, the call with me right now. And that's Amanda Bocci. That pronounce that right, Amanda? Baki. Very good. Uh, and so um, Amanda has led an, I, I would like to say, an interesting life. Would you agree? Okay, um, so um, you have had a uh, had to deal with um, a drug addiction, and it was uh, a difficult struggle for you. How long? How long were you dealing with that addiction? I mean, on a daily basis, I guess. Yeah how how long were you How long were you? Um, um, Active drug addict. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second, Amanda. I think I got some audio issues here. Sometimes, um, oh. sometimes this uh, transcoder or this uh, you there? Mm, I'm not getting any. Oh, I can hear you. Yeah, just a second. Okay, there we go. You there? Yes. Okay, very good. So you were, I'm sorry, you, you were an active drug addict for 10 uh, years? Almost, yeah, about a decade. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so you 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 were in the you were hospitalized. Um, what was that? Seven times, I think he was, and in, in four years. Yes. Yes, it was about seven times in four years, um, and that's an estimate. I mean, honestly, I was in and out every single time that things uh, that my addiction got so bad that my mental and emotional illness. Um, it was just too intense for me to bear, and every time I, every time I went into withdrawal, uh, 
and, and things got really ugly and they, and they seemed to happen on a cycle of like, you know, once every couple of months or so, I would have a pretty bad um, emotional breakdown and I wasn't able to maintain. So I, I ended up in the hospital several times and that was for, you know, comorbid issues of um, drug addiction and, and illness. Okay, so so on your on your website, um, mm -hmm. and I I've got the website listed up here for anybody that um, is interested in seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, as, anyway, on your website there was you went through and described um, the experience, and I picked out a few things that uh, really jumped out at me, and this one statement: uh, the destruction that occurred due to my drug abuse is the most powerful, tragic, and beautiful experience I've been through. Yeah. So, so what went into comprising that statement? I mean, it's, you know, we, we look at really negative things as though they're really negative instead of looking at things that are incredibly challenging as a blessing in disguise and, um, Honestly, you know, like if you've ever been in a 12-step program and you've talked to people or you've, or you've even been in any of the rooms uh, like AA or NA, you'll, you'll hear people who say, um, I'm a grateful uh, recovering addict. And, and that's true because they're truly grateful for that time that they spent being an addict because it taught them so many things that they would not have learned. Um, and for me, that was my path. You know, I don't, I don't know why that needed to be my path, and I don't know that it did need to be my path. But uh, the truth is, is that it, it was from that low breaking point and from that darkness that I grew um, so dramatically. And now, you know, three years removed, I'm living a life that I genuinely did not believe would ever be possible for me. And uh, I mean, that's, that's just the power of, of grace. Now, when you say a, a beautiful experience, I, so I understand the silver lining aspect of, you know, as we, as we meet challenges that we go through in life and we, um, we come through those challenges and we understand, um, how those challenges go to make us better, um, is that, is that how you meant the beautiful experience aspect of it? Yeah, I mean, what's more beautiful than the soul transitioning from being uh, fully human into, in, into realizing that I'm part of, you're part of the divine? Like, I can't, that, that, that breaking point was the, was the point that brought me to recognizing my own divinity, my own spirit, my own eternal nature that that it exists regardless of of this body or not um i can't imagine anything more beautiful than that i mean that was that was a transition that is just uh all worthy for me very good um so here's another here's another thing that kind of jumped out of me now and uh so some aspects of what i was reading um i recognize and i've seen you know over and over um or at least associated with a drug addiction mm -hmm. and so this this one, uh, one I found very interesting um, you say I, I had many prostitute friends mm -hmm. sex work is a typical way to make drug money I knew all the pawn shop owners in my town because I sold everything that I had meaning uh, or, va or value to me I stole jewelry and money from family members and friends I manipulated and lied to serve my habit and I watched people who overdosed and died to just wake up enraged that I revived them and I found that interesting. So what was that experience like? <laughs> I mean, it's complete madness. Your, your entire personal reality is so skewed that <clears throat> the, the evil becomes normal. Uh, things that normal people would say, you know, that's truly evil become a resource to you. Um, you know, like I, I just I can't I can't explain to you how 
how normal all of that was to me. Like the the people that I was around, and they they weren't friends. They were just drug using partners. Um, you know, and you would combine efforts to be able to come up with enough money for your for your dope. Mm-hmm. So, and it's and it's cheaper to buy in bulk than it is singles. So you would you would work with other people to try to you know come to a goal, and. Um, you know, I had I had a couple of friends who fell into prostitution and became back page girls. Um, and I'm just really grateful that I didn't go down that road. I mean, I was definitely I was definitely playing, uh, you know, with manipulating men, manipulating my family um, in order to get to get gifts and money. And I mean, it, it's just it was just the only way that I knew to survive and, um, and survival meant having dope. If I didn't have it, I did not feel like I could live. I I genuinely, like my, my thinking was so skewed that I thought I needed to have heroin in order to be a good parent. Like, you know, that, that thinking, I couldn't get past the idea of, of withdrawing of not having that substance because I was so emotionally attached to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, your, your brain is just in a very different place. Your experiences are in a different place. I mean, I, I did, I saw a lot of people die in front of me and then come back angry that that you revived them, that you brought them back to life because they're, you know, they're not high anymore. Or, you know, where's my dope when they wake up? Um, and then you're like, oh, my God, they're going to die again. So it, it's just a very, it's, it's, it's a dark culture. You can't, it can't not be. And your thinking, your thinking is so far removed from what normal people, how a normal brain operates that you can't compare so so what was it like my guess is you've had to spend a lot of time rebuilding those those family relationships that were probably damaged during this uh time of your life what was it like rebuilding those those relationships well i'm sorry what was it like rebuilding those relationships yeah yeah what 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 was what was the process of rebuilding those family relationships my guess Mm -hmm. is that the family relationships became strained because of that is that, is that true? I would, I would say that the family relationships were pretty strained before it came to that point, which, uh, for me, my, my addiction really stems from early childhood of origin issues, which is common for a lot of addicts. That's not unusual. Uh, so I've got a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse, and, and you know, some, not a lot, but I, I have had some really strained relationships in my early childhood with important people in my family. Mm -hmm. And, um, so this, this is really more or less a result of that, that, that manifested in a, in a different way because that, that's what numbed all of the pain. Um, so I'll be honest with you, throughout that experience, though, throughout my addiction, because addiction runs in my family. It's not just me who's an addict. My adoptive father is also an addict. My biological father is an addict. My mother has never, you know, had an addictive personality. She's the most logical person I've ever met. Um, But, you know, they, we already had a pretty, a pretty difficult relationship, so addiction yeah definitely made it worse but um it it it, it honestly brought us back together and and that's the beauty of I, I feel like i'm helping to break a generational you know the bible talks about generational curses and and really i feel like part of my recovery and and healing these relationships and and loving people who've really harmed me and, and showing forgiveness and, you know, understanding as a child, I, I didn't know why my dad, you know, behaved the way that he did. I didn't understand. Um, I felt like addiction was a joke that, 
you know, that's a crutch that you use to blame people for your actions. And, you know, I grew a lot of compassion through that experience. It's just, I feel like the way that God works through things. Um, and so we've all come, we've all come full circle. And now, uh, like, honestly, I, like towards the end, my mother was a huge resource for me in my recovery because she started caring for me um, in a different way. She started to show me compassion, which allowed me to show myself compassion and then allowed me to show my dad compassion. It's been a, it's been a domino effect that has benefited my entire family. Oh, very good. Um, so you, you said that you had pawned uh, or sold all of your possessions ex and the, the, um, the one thing that you did mention was that you, you kept your guitar. So you sold it and mm -hmm. kept, sold everything except your guitar? Well, I had a lot of guitars, but I ended up selling everything except for one uh, really terrible $100 classical guitar. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, and, and so in your recovery, was, was that, did you use the, your musical background as a, uh, a tool of that or did that just come out of it after you have, you know, brought yourself to a point of where you can move forward? <clears throat> oh, no. Like, the whole time I was in active addiction, I I wrote music. I mean, I started playing guitar when I was nine. I've been writing songs since earlier than that. Uh, so music has never stopped being part of my self-expression. It's my favorite way to express myself. Um and so I, I wrote throughout all of it the entire time. Okay. And so you've, and you, you've just, now is that what you do for a living now? Is that how you sustain yourself? It is. Yeah. I'm actually a songwriter for a church. <clears throat> and I, uh, I perform and I'm recording my second album now called Organ Donor. And this album is about the transition from heroin to heroin, where um, I was sick and in darkness, and then, you know, the transition into light. Okay. And um, so one of the things that you mentioned is that people only change when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. Mm -hmm. And so currently we're, as a society, we're dealing with the Oxycontin craze. I, I, wanna, I don't want to call it a craze, but the problem of um, addiction to Oxycontin. And addressing that um, is one of the, the things that is going to help us move forward with this. And if we only see that um, they're going to make a change. So, so do we, how do we address that? How, how do we help those people if we realize that the only way that they're going to make that change is when they feel like making a change? That, that all of the things that we can do to, because uh, like you mentioned, you've gone to um, uh, um, looking for the term um, rehabilitation centers. You went to expensive mm -hmm. rehabilitation centers. You went to, uh, you know, retreats and um, this was because you chose to, not because um, necessarily um, of something, uh, some other influence. Well, I mean, I would die, you know, like it, <clears throat> You have to be a very um, naive addict at this point, especially in in heroin specifically, uh, which is where I ended up. Now, OxyContin was huge in you know the two thousands, um, and then and uh, and then up through. But Purdue Pharma has been under you know sure. significant. Um, they've been heavily looked into and they've been charged like right. 
now the doctors are aware, like, oh, I don't need to give, you know, 30 milligram Oxycontin to someone who's had a tooth pulled. Like, they're, they're starting to get that. So I feel like the doctor culture is starting to shift to where they're really not over-prescribing as much as they used to. And then the people who were over-prescribed, you know, for chronic pain or something, uh, they're having to go to pain clinics and it's just pretty much managing their addiction. It's not really affecting their pain a whole lot. Um, so as, as far as the pill epidemic goes, I think that uh, we're starting to address that in a positive way um, because no doctor wants to have their license revoked because they're over-prescribing pain medication. And that's right now. Now, in certain parts of the country, in West Virginia, has had it really bad. Um, you know that that could be different and there's there's all all different types of ways to get something that you want uh, but I feel like they're starting to do a tighter hold on that which is what's necessary and then the people who've just been over prescribed are really in a tough spot because you know they're gonna have to either stay on that or they're gonna have to learn how to live without it and that's gonna be a really painful experience and until it's not anymore <clears throat> but um, you know, I think that's that's one good thing, just knowledge and awareness that you can't prescribe something that is truly uh, a life devastating narcotic to someone um, for an extended period of time unless it's truly necessary. And there are cases where it is. Uh, as I mean, the answer, in my opinion, to to the opioid epidemic is really just make treatment available, um, let people know where treatment is available. That was the hardest part for me. Uh, I did not, I could not find treatment. I, I like, when you're a drug addict, you're poor. Um, you are, unless you're selling, which I wasn't, I was strictly a user, uh, you know, you don't have resources for insurance, state-funded insurance, um, you know, I didn't have Medicaid, I had nothing. So what resources were available were ones that were state run or through the ER, which is why I was hospitalized so many times. Okay. You know, so if we made that possible, it could start to shift things. So, so part of, part of what you believe is the problem is availability of drugs. So, so if we put, if we put the responsibility on, on, um, doctors to know when a patient should or should not have more pain management. Then we're then aren't we putting the responsibility outside the individual? Well, yeah. I mean, but if you're addicted to a, a medication that you think is solving all of your problems and you have a limited point of view, then you you go to a doctor for a reason. And that doctor is supposed to help guide you in the best methods to cure yourself of whatever your problem is. But, you know, if I have if I have appendicitis, I don't I don't talk to myself about it. I go to a doctor about it. Right, I understand you know, that. So. I, I I guess I'm I'm just a, um, exploring the idea that um, if we if we make people outside the individual. So, so a doctor does not, um, they'll give you a chart and it says, you know, what is your pain level? Right. And you, and you point to something on the pain level. Um, the doctor does not know right. how, how accurate your being is. is mm -hmm. Right. And so sure. if, if, if you go to your doctor and you say, um, I need something to manage this pain and what you've given me at this point does not do it. Right. Um, and your doctor then says to you, um, well, you've reached what I think is a logical uh, amount of pain meds that you should have. Because my concern is, is that um, you'll go out and hurt yourself to try to get more pain meds because you'll become addicted. So now we're making someone outside the individual responsible for understanding what's going on inside the individual. Does that, does that make sense? Right. Um, 
You know, honestly, I'm not a doctor, so I and and I don't know enough about. I'm not like current on medical, like laws and practices and stuff. I do know that for a long time, doctors were over prescribing pain medication because um, it was being sold to them through pharmaceutical salespeople that worked for Purdue Pharma. They were lied to about the effects of the medication. They were told that you could take OxyContin for, you know, 12 hours or something and that it would be effective. And the truth was that it was only effective for eight hours. And so people were taking more of the medication. They said it was not addictive. It was addictive. So if they have all of this information, then yeah, I feel like a doctor can say and, and will say, you know, this is drug seeking behavior or, you know, you, you, a person your size should not have this much medication. You're not going to be able to metabolize it. Um, because the truth is, is someone's going to become physically dependent. Now, addiction and physical dependence are not the same thing. That is addiction correct. is a is a mental uh, attachment, yeah. right, to a substance. Whereas yeah. a physical dependence is you're taking it for a, a said purpose, and because as a result, your, your body becomes mm -hmm. right. So, so you might be, you might, you you will experience withdrawal symptoms, but it's not going to be. In the same mental game that someone who's truly addicted and recognized that and was seeking it uh, has. So there's there's a balance, and um, you know I, I really don't know what that looks like, but I know that in other countries that instead of prescribing opiates that they consider, you know, after surgery, uh, your you know pain is in your body for a reason. It's it's trying to tell you something, and part of the problem with opiates is that you think you're not hurt anymore, and then you keep moving and you hurt yourself more. Sure. So, so you know, recognizing that pain is actually a valuable thing for our body to have. If you can't feel it, then you don't know what way you're not supposed to move, or or what you're doing wrong, or or what's wrong with you. I mean. When I was in active addiction, I would be sick and never know that I was sick because I was on dope the whole time. I mean, it, it like almost took away everything, but then you get, you run the risk of being, getting really sick. And I'm in a lot of support groups with heroin addicts and, you know, and other opiate addicts who, um, who have severe, you know, trauma done to their body because they just neglected it because they couldn't feel it until it got so severe that they've got, you know, holes in their arms um, with infection. So, you know, pain, we, we have to change that perspective. In Germany, they drink tea after they have surgery, uh, as recovery. So just how we approach pain has to kind of shift. And I, I really believe that that's already happening, um, from, from what I've seen. Very good. So one of the things you also mentioned is that feelings are not facts. Yes. And I thought, I thought that was, um, I've, talked about that and I think it's interesting but that that sometimes um, what's the term perception um, is is just as powerful as facts though if I perceive that that something is that way then I believe that it is oh yeah and it can be but I had to go through a lot of therapy and I have a borderline personality disorder, and that's a pretty severe personality disorder. It, it means that I, I feel really, really intense emotions. Um, they come on very suddenly, and it can feel like uh, suddenly someone that I loved, I suddenly hate. Um, it's been that, that stark before, and I had to learn be, just because I feel that way doesn't mean it's a fact. Feelings change. Mm -hmm. Thoughts change. You know, we, we can't just succumb to, the, uh, to every single whim that our body has. That's what mastering control is. You know, I allow myself to feel, but I want, I want to not invest in every single emotion that I feel because it's just a feeling. Uh, no feeling is going to last forever. It's always going to change. And um, a attaching yourself to an emotion and saying, I am this, is, is just not true because you're not. And it's something that will pass. Or it's something that you need to take action on and just recognize. Um, so, you know, I, I don't not listen to my feelings. But if my feelings tell me 
you feel really bad, you should go do heroin. That used to work in the past. I can't listen to that feeling because uh, that's not a fact. That's how, just how I feel. It's recognizing what you should act on and, and how you should act on it. Yeah, discernment. Exactly. So you, you have, um, so we call them coping mechanisms. So you have developed different coping me me mechanisms than, than before. Oh, yeah. And that was a big one. That, I mean, and really, it's mindfulness. It's just like recognizing your deeper self and that, you know, I, I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. Uh, kind of looking at it through a third party perspective, um, through my eternal spirit versus, you know, the carnal me. Um, and that's the transition that's taken place. And it's been really, I mean, it, it's not like it'll never be done. Uh, like I'll never be fully transcended, I feel. But, um, but that's the, that's, that's been the, the biggest change that's happened within me is that I can see, I can see the spirit me that is eternal. I can also see the carnal me, which is fully in the flesh and, um, and recognize that I don't, I don't have to, to indulge in every single thought and feeling. I can let things go. Okay. So we've re actually reached the 30 minutes and I have a couple of questions and then I'm going to, I'm going to say thank you very much because I really do appreciate having a chance to talk to you today. Um, the one is, you know, um, tell me a little bit about your music. Okay. Well, um, I have a band. My name is Amanda Baki and the band, uh, Amanda Baki and Americana Soul Flood. And um, all of my music is, is really expressing um, all the things that I've been talking about, just this, this transition uh, from heroin to heroin. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and um, Amanda Baki, you can be uh, reached at amandabaki.com. Mm -hmm. And that's B-O-C-C-H-I. <laughs> B-O-C-C-H-I, yes. And let's see, there was one other, one other, question and I've just it's escaped me I'm trying to I'm like a trying to do three things at one time and and I keep a, a thought in my head so that runs um, so give me a second I'm gonna uh, close off the podcast I do uh, again thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me this afternoon yeah thank you so much This uh, podcast is streamed live each week on YouTube, uh, and now Facebook and Periscope. And you are encouraged to participate by asking questions and including your thoughts. To participate, contact Altitude Adjustment by connecting via Skype at thelionsden.stl at gmail.com or Google at thelionsden.stl at gmail.com. Please feel free to connect with me on Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, and on YouTube. Also, be sure to look for this and other episodes where you listen to podcasts. Your likes and shares are internet gold, so please like and share this podcast where you find it. Remember, be cool, be calm, and above all, be careful. Look out for the other guy, because they may not be looking out for you.